So I want to talk uh, just briefly. We weren't able to finish up last time. So, so thanks for all that feedback. Um, I have a, I should also say that I have a Google Sheet up. And your guys, um, I'd like you guys to type in your, your responses in there. I wanted to finish up by just uh, bringing everybody up to speed in terms of what we've been doing here, uh, continuing from uh, last week. And uh, I want to talk about a little bit of our, our personal history here at Cal State Channel Islands. Now, you guys had different dates that you dated uh, the, the origin of, of the modern drone industry. And, uh, you know, this, this, is, this is a fun debate to have. Depends on what, what, you, want to, what you want to talk about. But this, this was oftentimes stated as one of the initial, the, the birth of automatons, or the birth of robots. Um, this was not a robot, this is a fake robot. This is called the Turk, or the Mechanical Turk. Has anybody heard of this guy before? Oh, interesting. Okay, so this is, um, th this was first introduced at this, you know, King's Palace in 1770. And the idea was, it was a cap, nobody knows exactly what the very first one was like, and then basically all these knockoffs came in the, in the years afterwards. So then these things sort of spread across Europe and, and uh, around the world. But the idea was, so it's called a Mechanical Turk because it, it's, a, it's a, a robot guy that looks like a Turkman, right? In a fez and everything right there, in a turban. And so uh, this is a table of a chessboard. And so what happened is the king, the party goer, the whoever would come up and they'd play chess and this guy's arm would go and move uh, you know, a, a rook and it would move it over here, boom. And then, and then the, the um, player would move something. And so this thing, and it appeared to be a, a robot, right? Um, uh, some kind of non-living thing that was able to sense what the chess was going. And apparently, Especially early in the in the early years, very would almost always win. So it's unclear the very first one who was inside, but in the waves that came afterward, a lot of chess grandmasters were the guys that would do this. So they would climb into this cabinet. That you, so obviously they were small dudes because you had to you know, presumably dudes. All the people we know about were male, but maybe there was there was a, a woman in there, and uh, and so they were crouched up in this little crazy place, and through a series of of mirrors and other things, they could they could see what was going on, and they would they would make it move. And so this this became all the rage. And oh my gosh, these guys built an actual working robot, something that was capable of of moving on its own based on environmental stimul based on where the where the chess piece was. You know, really cool. So so we could possibly start start the date then, right? Probably not. Most people I think would would date the start of uh, aerial robotics to World War One, and uh, the big crazy, or, well there's many crazy technologies, airplanes being one, but zeppelins, uh, dirigibles, floating balloons were a big part of that, of that era and, and, and a very powerful technology and you know, both for moving people but also for spotting things and, and collecting intelligence and data uh, from high, high perspectives. And so the, the first thing that people, I think, more popularly would categorize now is what we call a UAV or a drone, um, dates in 1916. And this was a, a target aircraft. This was something that uh, um, basically was towed, and then people could practice trying to blow it out of the air. And the Americans were getting worried. And so the idea was they said, hey, can you take one of these things and make it fly itself so that you could go either run into a, a dirigible, into a, a zeppelin, or maybe run into the cables and cut it loose, right? So it was, it was an anti-blimp technology is what it was thought, of, thought to be. And so this is, this is an example where they're trying to launch it from a, from a car. Um, I think a lot of people are familiar with the, the v, V1 and, and, and the rockets that the Germans created during World War II. Again, this was, this was in response to a, a problem that the Germans saw, which was that they were getting slaughtered, and they were trying to attack, in this case, Great Britain. And they had, at that time, taken over France. 
So they were they were close to um, Great Britain. They only had to go over the, the English Channel, but they were losing men. They were having strains on their uh, in, um, equipment. So so they came up with this idea of this um, so-called vengeance weapon, and that's where the V comes from in the V. Uh, um, V1, or the, the name of it, and then the, the German um, term is below it. But the idea here is this was, this was rocket powered. This wasn't propeller powered. And these things were a weapon of terror. These were not accurate. They, in very early in the days of, of control technology and stuff, but the idea was you essentially have a rocket powered plane, basically, and by, by you know, aiming it and a, f a few simple controls, you can make it vaguely go in the direction you wanted to. So a very bad technology in terms of achieving what you want to achieve in terms of moving through the, through the environment. But as far as just throwing something that randomly is going to go right, left, and whatever, and, and obviously there's explosives on this, and kill a lot of people, it was very effective. And it made a distinctive sound as it came over people. So it, so it also had this real visceral, it wasn't just people dying, but it was this sort of striking fear into a populace. And you know the crazy Nazis love that. So, so, so that's an advancement. And that, that, in turn, the people that developed this came from a similar effort like that World War, like the one we just saw in World War I, which was using radio control to control small planes, what we might call toy airplanes now, um, as a, again, as an idea to, to use it as a weapon. And, and I apologize, this sounds like the History Channel slash the War Channel version of UAVs, but um, unfortunately, a lot of the technology, the early days especially, was birthed out of this war stuff. Um, again, we can progress up to something like the 1950s, where, um, a, a, again, the issue here was um, how do we do stuff without endangering pilots or endangering equipment? And so this was um, the first, actually the first I think it was called Ryan Model 136, but this is, this is a slightly older version. Um, and again, using airplanes as a default model, tweaking them with different types of control systems to, mod to, to have typically in this case by radio control, modify the ailerons and the, and the different flaps and things. I think a lot of you guys would, and in the public, I think sees this, the, the Predator, the, um, one of the early Predators, this wasn't the earliest, but this was, this was the sort of earliest production model, uh, Predator. This model was introduced um, in 1994 a lot of this, so Vietnam War was a huge driver of a lot of technology and, and uh, autonomous control and t telemetry and things of that nature. We hit the 1980s and, and that, that, that push dies down. There's still a lot of advancements that are happening, again, mostly in the military, but um, they're, well, yeah, under military contractor, people building things for the military. A uh, lot of advancement but not a lot of buyers. Still, the Air Force is dominated by people that think the way you project military power is by humans seated in aircraft and the humans are controlling the, the airplane. Um, but uh, we have the, the first Gulf War, 1991, and that adds a huge um, push and a huge shift to using these devices primarily for data collection for intelligence gathering. And then the results of, the results of that early you know, huge use in, in the first Gulf War, we start to see in the mid 90s, the birth of what we now would consider the modern military uh, drone. And that's really where, as a society, that's really where the, the term drone uh, comes from what, what, in terms of what we associate with flying robots. Um, and w as you know, we have a question about that on our poll to look at that. Um, we'll have, when we have more time, we'll have a longer discussion. In fact, I'm thinking about having you guys help me craft because there's so much I don't know. We might do sort of a crowdsource version of some of this history. But um, the short version is we really see the commercial sector blow up. So a lot of you guys said you would date the, you know, the 2000s-ish, right? And that's totally understandable. That's really when the, when the private sector, the commercial, the non, uh, you know, gazillion dollar military secret program type development efforts. That's really when those other things got going. And so uh, the 
most important company in this context is going to be DJI. We use a lot of their products. You guys have seen a lot of their products. You guys will be flying some of their products in a, in a few weeks. Um, and so this is, uh, again, more about them in a little bit. Uh, Romeo Durscher from DJI will, will do a telepresence lecture for us because he can't come down from San Jose uh, for our class. But, but basically, um, the granddaddy. The granddaddy of what we would call the modern private uh, consumer drone industry. Really, is, there, there are others. There are absolutely others. But this is the big, uh, big guy. They started in 2006. Um, and literally, the first control systems are built over, like, what was the chase? Like a, a month or something. These guys got in a hotel room, and they just sort of hacked it together. Um, another major one here is 3DR. So they spin up. So Chris Anderson leaves Wired Magazine and he, he starts this um, a company, but really on a, on a different, slightly different business model approach than DJI. DJI is the Apple computer version of the drone industry. So a lot of attention to detail, a lot of this and that, but very closed. 3DR is very much the opposite. It was really birthed out of this notion of open source. They form, uh, they also form a, a forum where you guys can all participate in, an online forum where people can share ideas, how they can program this device, how they can, how they can overcome challenges with the technology. So 3DR really gets going in 2009. Um, 3DR is basically, <laughs> I, in a year or two, this might be a history lecture because it's not clear that 3DR will still be around in a couple years, but that's another story. And then we get to our own, the beginnings of our own formal history with this technology. So um, uh, this Delta, is anybody helping uh, Dr. Isaacs in his lab with this? Chase is a little bit. So um, essentially these folks, so this, this, is a, this was designed for military research, this unit. Um, and this is, uh, we call it a fixed wing, but it's, it's a specific type of fixed wing, we call it a delta wing, right? Where the, where the wing is sort of fused into the body. It's not a, it's not a separate projection from a cylinder. So this guy, um, and here the propeller is in the back. And you'll see some, some sensors sticking out, up the, out there. Uh, some folks that developed this, and this was developed, I think this was first built in 2002, I believe. And, and used to test some essentially control systems and communication systems. And they were done with it, this is old technology. Essentially what we're seeing is a big, huge shell and then some old clunky electronics inside. Uh, and and they're, they're done with it. They were gonna get rid of it, right? This is kind of beat up. They, and so this, this is one that takes off, but also it lands on its belly. So, you know, it's kind of something that crashed a lot. And these guys had two of these units and they said, hey, you guys want this? And we said, sure, yeah, we do. So we said, thanks, you know, we went to go get it. And uh, President Rush at the time, our, our then president, our great president, said, uh, no, th no thanks, right? No, no, we're not gonna accept that. And uh, I said, and some of my colleagues from computer science said, wait, what? And he said, look, we don't want this because of that history I just went through, again, History is much longer, we'll get into it, but, but that's the, you know, we have a large, this technology is rooted in weapons and in violence and that kind of stuff and in spying on folks, right? Uh, he's like, no way, we're not doing that. And so we pushed back and said, no, 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 no. This is like a thing, this, is, this can be good. Right? And he said, look, I'm worried about you spying on people. I don't know why you worry about me spying on people. But worried about spying on people, worried about invasion of privacy, worried about safety, all those things that, you know, totally reasonable things to be worried about. And so we pushed back and said, no, 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 no. We're worried about that too. I mean, we don't want to do that. And so to his credit, President Rush is a great guy because for, for, for many reasons, but one of them um, and I would posit as you guys are going out in your careers and all this and that, um, don't judge people based on their first response, right? Judge people based on when they have a bit of time to think about it, right? In this case, he said, you know what? Maybe I'm wrong, but my concerns are real. I'd like you guys to go and address those concerns. If you can address these concerns, worry about safety, worry about um, you know, uh, invasions of privacy and those things, then I'm good, then we'll accept it. 
So I said, okay. Most people have not taken that route. The Ventura County Sheriff's Department has. The Ventura County Sheriff's Department has search, uses this technology for search and rescue, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. But they started with looking at this a few years ago and saying, wow, this is really powerful. But you know what? Just like President Rush, it, this is maybe dangerous, right? This is maybe um, invasions of privacy type stuff. So they went, I think a responsible action, that law enforcement entity went to the Ventura County supervisors and they said, hey, we're thinking about doing this. Is that cool? What do you guys think? And the supervisors debated it. The public could have some input, this and that. Finally, they said, yep, go for it. So they, Ventura County Sheriff's Department acquired, started acquiring units, and um, they barely use them. I think they should use them much more than they probably do. But, but they started almost never using it at all. And then it's a little bit more the next year and a little bit. So they've been very, very, very cautious, right? So the public knows about them. They have very clear policies as to when they use them. And they've been, they've been trying to just bring it out slowly. That's a responsible way to use this technology. Most people are not as responsible. And not to throw anybody to the bus, but let's talk about LA Police Department, the LAPD. This is a protest from about two years ago, so ago, two, 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 three years ago. And so these guys are saying out in front of the police headquarters in Los Angeles saying, no way, man, we don't want your drones. Why are they saying that? Because the LAPD had just purchased a huge, uh, you know, a, 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 a stable of UAVs. Where did they purchase their UAVs from? From, the, from companies? No, they got them at a discounted price. Where? The Seattle Police Department. Why was the Seattle Police Department buying them? Because the Seattle Police Department bought them from industry and they started to get them and the public said, no way, dude, we don't want these drones because they also did not engage with the community to start with. And so then they're like, oh, we gotta sell these. Okay, let's sell them. And LAPD's like, we'll take them, right? <laughs> so like, are you kidding me? Like, what? So then because of this pushback, LAPD has, has pulled back and said, whoa, 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 not, they're not getting rid of the units, but we're going to engage in a, a long-term dialoguing with the community to figure out what is the appropriate, when should we be using this technology, when should we not be using it. So, so I, would, I would say that the LAPD is now being, is taking a responsible course, but, but they you know, stepped in a huge pile of rah, rah, right, by, by not um, doing that process. So, um, so, in our, so, fla so that, that's, that's the general setting. So flashback to us. So, the, so President Rush said, here's the deal. You guys can accept these this initial gift of these uh, UAVs, which again, they, they couldn't fly. I didn't say that, but they, they, were, they were busted and old, right? So we'd have to fix them. So it wasn't like someone gave us this brand new Ferrari and said, you want to start driving a Ferrari, right? It was like, hey, here's this skanky old dart. You want the skanky old dart? And we're like, yes, please. And so, so we spent what ended up being about a year and a half of talking to lawyers and talking to administrators and just this whole thing where we would create something and then our thing would go to the administration, then our administration it would go to our lawyers, then our lawyers would send it to the CSU head, you know, head lawyer in Long Beach and they would look at it and then someone would get changed and then it would come back down the chain and then we'd have more meetings and change and go back up the stream. And so it was just very frustrating. And again, I was really disappointed by this process because I thought, as we've talked about, every little 12 year old is flying a Phantom or, on the beach and this and that, but yet we can't, we're not allowed to do this, right? Totally messed up in my humble opinion. Um, but long story short, we ended up generating the first, our first policy, we're, we're now revising this policy, but uh, this, our first policy, and that's the thing on the left, it's our unmanned, we created what's called the Unmanned Systems Board. And again, not, not to be sexist, we probably should call it the unpeopled, but, but that's <coughs> not the common terminology. So. So unmanned, meaning robotic, um, and this applies to stuff in the air. So this doesn't apply to, um, for example, Dr. Claveau's driving robots and stuff. It doesn't apply to our underwater ROVs. The Coast Guard is just now starting to talk about restrictions on, on underwater robots. But right now, unless we're in a military base setting uh, or something like that, there, there, there are basically no restrictions. Um, so there is no equivalent of the FAA for the underwater world at, at this point. Um, but those regulations are coming. Uh, so anyway, so this is for our flying robots, and essentially what it does is it creates 
a, just like we mess around with people, we have our human subjects board. And our, on our campus, it's called an IRB, Institutional Review Board. And if, if, so for example, our poll has been approved by the IRB. So that's, that's been all checked out and, and good to go. Uh, if we're doing some psychology experiment in the labs upstairs, right, all of those are approved. And that's because, again, people, researchers like us, that maybe had some, at times, questionable ethics, uh, did some stuff to people that was messed up. Right? We've withhold, withheld medical treatments when people perhaps are ill or suffering from a disease. We've intentionally, so like, you know, this is the opening of the, the first Ghostbusters, right? When Bill Murray's sitting there and there's this attractive young lady and he's trying to you know, score with her and there's this other guy and he's showing the cards and the guy's getting the cards right and, he, and he's shocking him and the woman is getting it wrong. And he's like, you're so, you're so, you're so great, you know, you're, that, you're so smart. How did you know that was a star, right? Um, so you know that has that that joke has its roots in what some messed up things that have been done, right? The experiments where there's a guy in this room and somebody in the next room, and you push the button and you hear the guy scream, right? When he's not actually getting tortured, but it's actually so. It, anyway, you guys you guys get the the idea. So all of anything we do with people has to be approved. Any research with people um, has to be approved by this review board. And it's not meant to not have people do research. It's meant to, like, let's just make sure that we're doing everything totally chill, right? Totally above boards. And it's not, not illegal or not uh, violating someone's human rights or whatever. We've created the same thing for use of research, use of, in teaching, that kind of stuff. And so we have this board. Uh, I am one of the board members, so it's kind of weird that I created it, but I'm on it, but you know, small university. So so, um, so on this board are faculty, there are administrators. And so anybody, Dr. Patch wants to go fly, Chase is going out and flying something, a Dan, Dan, Daniel's doing this stuff out, all these different things, right? The idea is, hey, you wanna use it for this class? First you submit your application and we check it out and we make sure it's all legit. And also, you know, if there's some specific concern about maybe you should make sure you have your fire extinguisher you know, that kind of stuff. If we're worried about sensitive species, like, hey, maybe you shouldn't fly during the breeding season, you know, those kind of things. So we act as a double check, and the board approves it. Boom, stamp for approval, awesome. And then you can go do your stuff. And so totally covered by insurance, we've done our due diligence, et cetera. So we get this up and running, and we start to go. And then um, this is two falls, this is two Christmases, well, two Decembers ago, right after classes, I should have, I need to add in a slide to show this, but I space on that. Uh, uh, finish up finals, grade and finals, a memorandum comes down from the chancellor's office to every president across the 23 campuses of the CSU. And it starts out very dangerous, right? Just like what I was talking about, like when, when the facilities ask us to go fly, the like, same kind of feeling I got. The letter opens up, ah, oh, you know, love this technology you guys are doing such great stuff workforce of the future and I'm like wait what they're, they're talking too nice right like what is going on here and and uh basically you know all oh, this great stuff you guys are doing so much great stuff with students uh by the way stop all uav activity uh until we say anything different so they were we were frozen everybody was frozen cal poly pomona that's had an aeronautics program for 40 years and has been building different things frozen uh, you know, just across the board, it was insane. So what had happened was, um, uh, we're almost out of time here, but um, I'll show you guys this next time. But what had happened was, uh, the CSU massively risk averse, massively risk averse, and there had been some publicized accidents back east, and it freaked them out. And so even though, now we will get some different views from some of our lawyer friends, but basically the FAA argu arguably had no authority to limit uh, the kind of use of drones that we have historically done, but they don't want you to know that. They didn't want us to know that. So they literally would go to their website and put up a policy on their website and then send threatening or intimidating letters to people. And then say, you can't do that, you're violating the law. No law was actually being violated. Right? Or if you did, if people did something, if they crash into a building, there's already a law for that. You can't vandalize stuff. You can't break people's property. You can't spy on people. I don't care if you got a robot spying or it's your eyeball spying. 
that's not allowed, right? So it turns out most of the worries that we have are already covered, if not all the worries, by existing uh, legal frameworks. But the FAA wasn't up for that, so they, they basically sent out a bunch of threatening letters. The CSU, oh my God, oh my God, stop! And so they stopped. And uh, so we were frozen again. Uh, and so, you know, what are we gonna do? And so the short version is, um, they finally unfroze it about six months later, and they allowed uh, four campuses, CSU campuses, to go back to flying. And we were one of, we were like in that first group. But what they said was, they didn't say, hey, go back to what you're doing. They essentially took our policy, our unmanned systems board policy we developed here at Channel Islands, and they said, uh, they didn't say you have to clone this or copy this, but a lot of folks did, which was cool. But they said you have to, it has to be consistent with this policy, meaning you have to create an oversight board, you have to you know, have some training, all, all that kind of stuff. So what turns out is this little podunk thing, and we're in the this, this, you know, smallest of the CSUs, we're this little baby new campus, we don't have money, we don't have buildings, we don't have this and that. And I just figured that we, that we were just way behind the ball. It turns out we were actually scary, but we were sort of in front of the ball, right? And so this policy is now looked on as a model from a lot of different folks, different community colleges are emulating this, et cetera. Um, at the same time, we started our, our blog, our AAR. Some of you guys are helping us out with our AARR group. You guys are all welcome to if you want. But, but basically, um, this blog has also been really, really helpful. So you know, we just post things occasionally. It's not like we're doing stuff every day. Uh, on there, but it's been a really helpful way to start to communicate to people about what we do. Most folks, it turns out, had a t had slash have a totally incorrect view of what we do with this technology, right? They'll see something, as you guys are mentioning, something, ho a horrible news story, an accident, something bad, and then the assumption is we're doing that same thing. Totally different in most instances. And so this Having both the policy, the, 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 the official, formal university policy supporting this, having a way to talk to people, post our videos, do this and that, it, it allows people to understand, people that, that aren't necessarily anti-drones, but they're neutral. They're neutral, you know, they have, no, I don't know about this. I haven't made up my mind. This, this blog really, really helps. And this blog has helped us do a bunch of things. Um, we're, we're out of time, so we'll, maybe we'll go over to this more, more in a second, but I'll just note that a lot of our research collaborations and a lot of the projects that some of you guys are working on now came directly out of that blog, or, or because people found us through that blog. So I just got invited to go to another university to, to talk to them about their stuff. There was a thing this week about, can you come up and do this? And that's, and that's not because we're, we're on the front page of newspapers or anything, it's because we have our blog. And so when people look for stuff, People are starting to find out this is a place where you guys can come and play with this stuff, right? You guys can crash stuff, don't crash stuff. You guys can crash stuff, you guys can build stuff on the 3D printers, right? You can screw it up, you can reprint it. And of course our colleagues at the universities are doing great stuff and, they, and they're doing awesome, awesome things. But we really have this education focus, right? As opposed to that, that strong research focus. And then since we're out of time, I'll just, I'll just end, I'll just end by noting that Dr. Isaacs got a small grant uh, that Chase, I guess some, some, other folks, some of our other students are helping him. We're actually rebuilding one of these things. So we're actually seeing if we can get it up off the ground and everything. So it's kind of interesting. So that, that, that was really the beginning of our, of our entrance and messing with robotics and that kind of stuff. And uh, it soon will, be, um, soon will be up and flying. So maybe we'll even be able to fly. Will we be able to fly it this semester, you think? Possibly. Possibly. So the answer is probably not. I think they're going like, to fly it once.